ever since Nebuchadnezzar uh, destroyed the city of Babylon in 586 B.C., for you note takers and who uh, would like to jot down notes, 586 is a very, very important date to remember as it relates to um, uh, the scriptures and to uh, the history of Israel. But in 586 B.C., Nebuchadnezzar came in uh, as the Babylonians pretty much destroyed the city of Jeru Jerusalem and and destroyed the temple, and ever since then, <clears throat> the city of Jerusalem would lie in a state of ruins for nearly 150 years. For 150 years, the city of Jerusalem was just pretty much laying there in ruins, and uh, it wasn't until 444 B.C. Uh, when a Jew by the name of Nehemiah, who was living in Persia, serving the king of Persia as cupbearer, would get, um, receive a burden from the Lord to go back to the land of his forefathers to make a pilgrim, pilgrimage of around a thousand miles from the citadel in Susa all the way to the city of Jerusalem to help rebuild the city and in particular the city walls. And so that's really what the book of Nehemiah is about. It's the, the detailing of Nehemiah leading in the rebuilding of the wall. Now here in Nehemiah chapter 3, Nehemiah has already returned to the city of Jerusalem, and he is now leading the charge to rebuild the walls and the gates to the city. There are lots of people who are part of this building project. These people have different assignments and different positions along the wall to help in this rebuilding, and, uh, and all of their positions are extremely important. Now, last week we spent the majority of our time looking at the gates that are listed here in this chapter. Uh, does anybody remember how many gates there were around the walls of Jerusalem. There are 10 gates, and they're mentioned here in chapter 3. Each gate had a specific name, and each gate had a specific purpose. Now, we only looked at five of them last Sunday, uh, but they repaired, as they repaired the gates, you may remember that they moved, uh, they repaired them counterclockwise around uh, the wall. Very, very methodical as they were repairing the, the, the walls and the gates. And with each gate, as I mentioned last Sunday, there is a modern parallel, uh, a New Testament, New Testament truth that I think we need to be aware of that really uh, applies to us personally as well as corporately as a church. And again, last week we looked at the first five and we noted the lessons that they teach us. We first looked at the sheep gate. You see it up here on the screen. The sheep gate was the first gate that they looked at. It was a northern part of the city, but the sheep gate... Um, <clears throat> Well, this, this is an example of the, of the wall and the gates. We'll go to the next slide. There we go. The, at the top, you'll see the sheep gate. Uh, the sheep gate was the gate, as you would imagine, the gate where people would bring in their sheep or their lamb to be uh, sacrificed uh, for sin. And, of course, the sheep gate uh, points us to Jesus, who, uh, as John the Baptist described, uh, in pointing to Jesus, uh, the lamb of God who comes to take away the sins of of the world. So the sheep gate, uh, we'll go to the next slide. Can you go to the next? There we go. Uh, the sheep gate, there at the top. So the sheep gate obviously is to point us to, to, to Jesus Christ. Secondly, there was the fish gate. The fish gate. This was the entrance into the city where the fishermen would enter as they brought in all their fish to be sold in the markets. So this gate speaks of really for it really speaks of evangelism for us. Uh, we know that Jesus told his first disciples, many of whom were fishermen. He told them, come, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And so last Sunday, we spent some time talking about how we as believers, we need to be casting out our net wide and far uh, to bring into the kingdom of God uh, as many who would believe uh, by faith in Jesus Christ. So that's the fish gate. The third gate is referred to as the old gate. The old gate is found there in verse 6. The old gate uh, was in fact said to be the oldest gate there on the wall of Jerusalem, and it was where the elders would meet to, uh, to uh, um, dispense their wisdom. And so the old gate should point us to wisdom and truth uh, that is revealed from, uh, uh, in the Bible from God's Word. Uh, of course, I mentioned last Sunday that Jeremiah 6, verse 16 uh, actually refers to the Word of God as the old paths or the old way. And the, script, the truth of Scripture may indeed be old, but it is not outdated and it is not antiquated. Uh, we never outgrow the truth of Scripture. We never move beyond the truth of Scripture. We get a lot of this talk in our own culture of, of well, we just know more today. Uh, no, we don't know more than what the Bible has to say to us. And so 
Uh, we never outgrow uh, the truth of God's Word. So as individuals and as a church, we are to stick closely to the unchanging world as we live in an ever-so-changing culture. So that's what the old gate teaches us. Then we have the fourth gate, which is the valley gate. The valley gate. Now, the valley gate is one that opened up into the three valleys that surrounded the city. There was, in fact, the Kidron Valley on the eastern side, the Triropian Valley on the western side, and the Hinnom Valley on the southern side. And, of course, valleys oftentimes speak in the Bible, uh, speak of trials and low points in our lives. And so we talked just briefly about how we're to never despise the valleys because in the valleys, uh, God is most certainly with us, but also in the valleys... Um, there's a lot of learning and a lot of growth that can take, take place uh, in the valley. So God, God does some of his greatest work in and through um, uh, us when we are in difficult uh, valley seasons in our lives. And then finally we had the fifth gate we looked at last Sunday, and that was the dung gate. The dung gate. This gate was where the people in the city would go through to take out their garbage and their trash and their waste and all that uh, yucky stuff. And of course, as believers... We, too, are to be about removing the sin uh, from our own lives. Not flirting with it, certainly not ignoring it, but we must choose to deal with it, and we've got to choose to pursue holiness. All right, well, tonight we're going to look at the remaining five gates here along the wall uh, of the city. And so as we continue kind of counterclockwise around the city, the sixth gate we come to in this, in this chapter is called the fountain gate. The fountain gate. It is mentioned in verse 15. It says, And Shalom, the son of Kol Hosea, ruler of the district of Mizpah, repaired the fountain gate. He rebuilt it and covered it and set its doors, its bolts and its bars, and he built the wall of the pool of Shelah of the king's gardens as far as the stairs that go down from the city of David. So here we have again the fountain gate. Now we know, obviously we know, that water is something of a necessity when it comes to living. And therefore we know that major cities back in uh, ancient times, but also even today, we think of major cities. Um, most major cities, ancient and modern, were built or, or near a, a large body of water. However, Jerusalem uh, is a notable exception. Jerusalem, the city of Jerusalem, was not built next to a major river, nor was it built next to a uh, body, a large body of water. And so the question is, how, didn't it, how then did the people uh, get water to survive? Well, the people of Jerusalem survived because of two uh, underground springs. If you're a note taker, um, two underground springs. One is what we will simply call an unnamed spring. Um, it was in the northern part of the city. It actually fed into what was known as the Pool of Bethsaida. Uh, it is mentioned in John chapter 5, verses 1 through 15. John's Gospel, chapter 5, 1 through 15. And there it says that it was near the Sheep Gate. So there was, again, an, an unnamed spring up near the Sheep Gate that led into the city and supplied water to the pool of the uh, Bethsaida. That was one water source. But the main water source for the city of Jerusalem, for the, really the entire city, was what was called the Gihon Spring. If you go to the next slide, I'll have a little X marking the spot of the Gihon Spring. Uh, this was located further south of the city, and this, again, as you note, the spring here is outside the city wall, all right? Um, the spring that furnished fresh water to the city, again, was located outside of the city. And that was, that was a big deal. Or actually, it was not a big deal unless you were being attacked by another nation. Because if you were being attacked by another nation, this is what that nation would do. Understanding that the spring was outside of the city... They basically would, would surround your city. They would hem you in so that you couldn't get out to go to get water. And so you would basically um, uh, starve to death or you either surrendered to the attacking nation. So it, it, this was a huge problem if your water supply was outside the city. Well, in 700 B.C., King Hezekiah, we looked at him when we were going through the Old Testament. King Hezekiah realized that this was a big problem. And so what he did is that he developed a plan to bring fresh water from the Gihon Spring into the city of Jerusalem. So what he did is Hezekiah had some, some men dig a tunnel, which would later be known as Hezekiah's Tunnel, which was uh, 1,750 feet long and about 60 feet below the surface of solid bedrock. 
Okay, now remember, the city of Jerusalem was built on a what? I would say a mountain, but it was kind of just a big rocky hill. Basically, a gigantic rock. And so these men had to dig this tunnel with pickaxes, you know, uh, through the solid bedrock. But this was done about 250 years before the days of Nehemiah. Now, Hezekiah's tunnel was a, actually a mystery uh, to biblical scholars and archaeologists until it was discovered in 1838. Uh, the tunnel, get this, was dug in a zigzag uh, pattern, and it was determined that the workers actually started at each end of the tunnel and worked their way to an eventual uh, meeting point. Uh, which is amazing to, to begin with. But the tunnel averages is about two feet wide and uh, about six feet tall. And there is running water that courses through the tunnel, even to this day, uh, that can be knee deep at certain times of, of the year. Uh, I have a photo of, the, um, of Hezekiah's tunnel. We'll go to the next one. Yeah. Those of you who have been to Jerusalem, have y'all, did y'all get to walk through Hezekiah's tunnel? Y'all never went through Hezekiah's tunnel? Y'all went through there? Was there water in there? You did? I heard that if you're, if you're a little um, claustrophobic, you better not go through it because it's kind of tight. Um, but you can go online and see some photos of tourists and stuff walking through Hezekiah's tunnel. Uh, it's, it's, it's pretty neat. Um, again, one of those places I would want to go. But this tunnel extends, again, all the way from the Gihon Spring outside the, outside the city all the way to the Pool of Siloam. How many of you all have heard of the Pool of Siloam mentioned in the New Testament, in the Gospels? All right, so the Gihon Spring goes all the way into the city and, and goes to the Pool of, of Siloam. And it is mentioned in verse 15 uh, as being by the fountain gate. All right, so that's where this, this, this tunnel uh, makes its way into the city. Now, much like uh, the tunnel, Hezekiah's tunnel, the Pool of Siloam inside the city it, too, is in many ways a mystery. Uh, they, for many years, they couldn't figure out exactly where the Pool of Siloam was. Uh, you have to remember, everything that was, uh, everything back then was eventually built upon itself. So it just, over years and centuries, it just kept, you know, growing. And so uh, everything was kind of, it was kind of buried, and they couldn't find it until 2004. The Pool of Siloam was not found and discovered until 2004. Uh, it was discovered... 2004, uh, actually accidentally, when the Israeli government decided uh, that they were going to construct a new sewer system. And so as they started digging and, and doing all that uh, and putting in pipelines, uh, they discovered the Pool of Siloam. Uh, the Pool of Siloam is about 225 feet long, uh, but its width is actually unknown. I, I think it may be a picture on the next one, next slide, um, or it may be the one after that. So you see the Gihon Spring kind of zigzagging all the way to the Pool of Siloam. All right, this is, yeah, the, you see the zigzag? So it's kind of making its way all the way to the Pool uh, of Siloam. The next picture, you'll kind of see a modern-day picture of the Pool of Siloam. Now, we, we have an understanding of the length of the Pool of Siloam, but we're not exactly sure the width of the, of the pool. Um, and it's not known because the side of the pool that is opposite of the city steps you can tell it's grown up with, with vegetation and, and is, you know, it's full of soil. And so it's possible uh, that the pool of Siloam back in Nehemiah's day, or even in Jesus' day, was much, much larger. But we don't know exactly how wide this pool was. But uh, it was a big pool in the city. Now here's the thing. The purpose of the fountain gate was for people to have access uh, to the pool of Siloam from outside the city. So if you were outside the city and you wanted to go to the Pool of Siloam, you went through the Fountain Gate. Now, the Fountain Gate, or the Pool of Siloam, excuse me, had much significance when you read the New Testament, in particular when you read the Gospel of John. There are two passages in particular uh, that I want you to think about. If you're a note-taker, you may want to jot these down. One passage in the Gospel of John, as it relates to the Pool of Siloam, that is very important, is John chapter 9. John chapter 9. In John chapter 9, it tells us of a miracle that Jesus performed right there near, uh, right there near this pool. Uh, there was a, a man who had been born blind, and Jesus heals this man by taking, um, uh, by taking his own spit 
he mixes it with some dirt, makes this mud concoction, puts it on his eyes, and then tells the blind man to go to the pool of Siloam there to wash it off. And when he did, he was healed and he could see. That all happened right here at the pool of Siloam. Another story that is found is in John's Gospel, chapter 7. John's Gospel, chapter 7. If you have a Bible, I want to I look at that uh, in particular. So if you hold your place here, turn to the New Testament Gospel of John. <clears throat> New Testament book, the Gospel of John, chapter 7. Now, I'm just going to read two verses uh, in John's Gospel 7. And we'll start in verse um, 37. John chapter 7, starting on verse 37, it says that on the last day of the feast, the great day, we'll talk about what that is here in a second, the great day, it says that Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now, this scene here transpires around the pool of Siloam, and it is said here in verse 37, that this all happened on the last day of the feast, the great day. Now, does anybody know what feast this is? Yes, it is in fact the Feast of Tabernacles, which is one of the three major feasts that is celebrated by the, by the Jews. It is also referred to in Hebrew as Sukkoth, Sukkoth, or the Feast of Sukkoth. Now, during this feast, get this, part of the celebration was actually to honor the Lord for the bounty of their harvest, as well as pray for rain. Uh, water then, as it is today, is a very special commodity. You know, I think we all kind of, at least I know I do, easily take for granted the fact that we want water, what do we do? We go to the faucet, turn it on, and we get nice, cool water. That's, they, of course, couldn't do that back then. They were so dependent on the rain for water. And so part of the Feast of Tabernacles was to pray for rain. Now, this feast was celebrated for eight days. It was an eight-day celebration. The eighth day, the last day, is said to be the last and greatest day of the feast. And that is the day when Jesus spoke. Now, for the other seven days, all right, you got eight days. The last day was the, you know, the, the greatest day. For the other seven days, what would happen is for seven consecutive days, a priest would take a golden pitcher from the temple and he would walk down these steps here, as you see, walk all the way down to the pool of Siloam. He would, he would take a pitcher of water from, from, the, from the, the pool. He would march back to the temple, and he would pour it out as a thank offering. Uh, it was a, as a way of thanking God for the water and for the harvest. But on the eighth day, the last day, considered to be the greatest day of, of the feast, the priest would do something a little different. On this day, what the priest would do is pouring the water uh, from the pitcher, he would read two passages of Scripture. He would read Isaiah 12, 6, and he would read Isaiah 44, 3, okay? And, and as I read this, um, I want you to think about what Jesus said in John chapter 7, okay? So Isaiah 12, verses 3 through 6, it says this, and this is what the priest would say on the last greatest day the eighth day, he would say, With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. And that day you will say, Give thanks to the Lord and call upon his name. Make known among the nations what he has done and proclaim that his name is exalted. Sing to the Lord, for he has done glorious things. Let this be known to all the world. Shout aloud and sing for joy, people of Zion, for great is the Holy One of Israel among you. So think about this picture for a second. Here this priest is, he's reading from Isaiah, he's saying all of this, the Holy One of Israel is among you, he is saying all of that, and little does he know that the Holy One of Israel is standing right next to him in Jesus Christ. But they did not recognize him. Then the, he, then the priest would read Isaiah 44, 3, listen to this. The priest then would read, For I will pour water on this thirsty land, and streams on the dry ground. I will pour out my spirit on your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. So, so really get the picture here. Okay, so every day of the feast, the priest goes down the pool, he gets some water, he takes it to the temple, he pours it out, then he, then he gets some more water and he pours it out. On the eighth day, he gets water, he pours it out, he reads Isaiah 12 and Isaiah 44. And when he does so, on the eighth day, Jesus stands up and says, Hey, folks, listen up. 
If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me, and I'll quench his thirst. That's what Jesus basically says. He says, whoever believes in me, as the scriptures has said, out of his heart will flow streams of living water. Now, of course, Jesus is not saying here, he's not speaking physically, saying, hey, come to me, I'll give you a cup of water, and you'll never thirst physically again. That's not what he's saying. He's not talking physically, he's talking spiritually. And Jesus made this statement to the people so that they would understand all of this symbolism about water it was really about satisfying the greater thirst that is in the heart of, of every human, uh, the thirst of the soul, that deep down inside of every human heart, there is this thirst. And every single person, before coming to Christ, those who are Christian, every single person will try to quench this thirst in either something or someone, whether more stuff or more people, more friendships, more relationships. People will go to a, a lot of different wells and broken cisterns. But Jesus is saying, I have the ability to quench your spiritual thirst and to satisfy the deepest longing of every single human soul. Now, John in verse, uh, uh, verse 39 of chapter 7, he adds clarification here to what Jesus was saying. In John 7 verse 39... Jesus said this, or John says this. He says, now this he said, Jesus, speaking about what he said. Now this he said about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were going to receive, for as yet the Spirit had not been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. So at this point in the Gospels, Jesus has yet to do what? He's yet to die on a cross, and he's yet to rise again from the, de the, the dead. So he has not yet glorified himself. He hasn't yet finished the work. But once he dies on the cross and once he rises again from the dead, we who trust in him as Savior and as Lord, his very presence by way of the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of us. And so John adds here in verse 37 that those who receive him after he has been glorified will receive the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. And when they receive that, there is, and you know this as a believer, there is this welling up effect that you have inside of you um, that we have in us as believers, and it is the very presence of God living within us. And that's why this gate here, the fountain gate, is said to be pointing us to the Holy Spirit and the soul, the soul-quenching satisfaction given to us by Jesus Christ. You see, apart from Christ... We will all search and search and search for something or someone to fill that longing in our hearts. And, and if you know somebody in your life, and we all do to some degree, it is, it is absolutely heartbreaking to watch people try to quench that thirst in everything and, 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 and lots of people thinking that it will get the job done. It is, it is, it is, it is just heartbreaking, to, especially someone that maybe a family member, someone you love, watching them run from empty cistern to empty cistern, thinking it will satisfy them. I think of John chapter 4, when Jesus came, came to the woman who was caught in a, or came to the woman uh, at the well. Do you remember the Samaritan woman at the well? And the Bible says that she had tried to quench her thirst in relationships, running from man to man. And what does Jesus tell her there? He basically tells her, listen, I can quench your thirst. I have water that will, never, that will never run dry. And, of course, she's thinking physical, right? But Jesus was not talking physical. He was talking, he was talking spiritually, that this woman had tried to quench that thirst in a number of different ways, and yet none of those things were ultimately satisfying her eternally. Uh, and yet Jesus was communicating, I am the living water. I can, I can satisfy you. But once again, when we come to the living water, Jesus Christ, he satisfies us like nothing this world could ever offer. Amen? We believe in him, and he plants inside of us this overflowing fountain in the Holy Spirit that never, ever runs dry. Well, that's the fountain gate, okay? So speak of the Holy Spirit inside of us um, and our relationship with Jesus that, that always satisfies. The seventh gate on our list, we're going to have to hit it and hold it, all right? The seventh gate on our list here is in verse 26, and it is referred to as the water gate, the water gate. And I will tell you, it has nothing to do with Richard Nixon, okay? Uh, it's in verse 26, and it says, And the temple servants living on Ophel repaired to a point opposite the water gate on the east and the projecting tower. Now, this is the only mention of the water gate here in chapter 3, uh, in verse 26. 
However, this gate is actually mentioned in, in other places in the book of Nehemiah. But there's something about this gate, uh, with this gate, that is not mentioned with the other gates. Does anybody know what it is? What is different about this gate from all the other gates? All right, I'll just go ahead and tell you. Uh, this, the water gate, get this, is the only gate out of all these ten gates, this is the only gate that did not need to be repaired or rebuilt. It is the only gate. All the other gates, were they had something broken. They needed to be fixed, but not the water gate. It was fine. No fixing hinges, no fixing bars, nothing. Now, the water gate, much like the fountain gate, was built for the purpose of allowing access to the Gihon Spring. So people would go through these two gates to go to and from the Gihon Spring and get water. They would go through this gate, the water gate. Now, whereas the fountain gate reminds us of the Spirit of God, the water gate is to remind us of the Word of God. When you read of uh, the word water in the Bible, many times, many times, it is used metaphorically in the Bible to describe the Bible itself. Let me give you one popular uh, example. It's in Ephesians 5. Verse 25 through 27, it says that Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy. Watch this. Cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. So Paul describes Christ as the groom and we as the church are, we are the bride. And Christ desires that we as the bride, that we be holy and pure. And so how does he cleanse us, his bride, his church? He does so through the washing of the water of the word. And let me just, let me just pause right here and, and just make this point of application, especially to, to, to any leaders here in the church. When, when you look at the scriptures in the New Testament and describes, like here in Ephesians, when it describes the church as the bride of Christ, I do believe that as spiritual leaders in the church, we have a responsibility to, to protect and to maintain the purity and the holiness of the bride of Christ, the, 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 the church, for the Lord. And, and the way that we as spiritual leaders do that is making sure that we are constantly washing the church with the water of the word. We're constantly teaching and pointing people to the truth of the scriptures. And it is a, it, it, I'm, I, because this is like, I'm, I'm in this as a minister and as a pastor. It's, it's also heartbreaking to watch how many churches will stray away from the word and end up becoming really just, just impure, um, uh, defiled churches in the sense that they're doing a lot of wacky, sinful stuff. Just stuff that's just like, that's just wrong. That is, and, and I think as spiritual leaders, we have a responsibility to make sure that we know the Word of God and that we're seeking to lead the church in the Word of God so that we're constantly washing the church with the Word of God and, 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 and protecting the holiness and the purity of the bride of Christ. For I think as spiritual leaders, we're going to be held accountable for that one day as, as leaders. And, uh, and listen, it is a, it is a high calling. It is, it is one that we are to take seriously as leaders. Um, but it is so important that, that we make sure as the best of our ability, because we're not sinless and we're going to make mistakes, but the best of our ability to know the Word of God and to lead the church in the Word of God. Um, but the Bible has this, and many of you have experienced this, but the Bible has this wonderful purifying effect on us when we read it and when we study it. I talk to people all the time, like on Sunday morning, and, and, and they'll say, you know what, I, I didn't want to come to church this morning, but I came and I was so blessed. Like the word of God as it is taught, even if it's just simply read, it has this way of just affecting us um, and, and, and purifying us as we're reading, sitting under the teaching of the word. Second Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says that the word of God, it teaches us, it corrects us, and it trains us in all righteousness. And so, therefore, as a church and as the people of God, we are, continue, we are to continue to keep the Bible central in all that we do. And this is so important. And I'm not going to go into depth on this because I talk about the Bible's importance a lot. But in, in a culture that is, that is changing, while we must, I do believe, at times and in some ways adapt, uh, sometimes in how we do things, one of the things that must never change is our commitment to the Word of God. We believe that the Word of God is inspired, it is inerrant, and it is infallible. So therefore, it takes priority 
and our time together. And it should take priority over our feelings, and it should take priority over the wisdom of man. Um, in fact, remember earlier when I said that the water gate was the only gate that did not have to be repaired? Uh, there's spiritual significance there. Um, the Word of God, it also, there's no need for it to be repaired or improved. It stands forever, and it will never fail. Okay, so that is the water gate. It is to point us to the water of the Word, the Scriptures. All right, moving right along. Uh, our eighth gate we have here is the horse gate. The horse gate. There is only one verse here devoted to this gate. It is verse 28. It says, Above the horse gate, the priest repaired, each one opposite his own house. Now, uh, as you can see, the horse gate, it actually stood north of the water gate and is adjacent to the temple area. Um, I believe because it is near the temple area, like the sheep gate, who was the one who was responsible for taking care of the sheep gate and repairing it? Do you remember who it was? It was the priest, okay? Uh, also, with, um, with this gate, the priests were responsible for repairing the horse gate, and I believe because of its close proximity to the temple gate. But nonetheless, historically, do you know what the, the horse gate um, was... Um, uh, the purpose behind the horse gate was the horse gate actually was located right next to the king's stables And so the purpose of the horse gate was so that men could ride their horses in and out of the city When they were in particular going out to war So the horse gate was used exclusively for the purpose of going to and from battle And when, when you think about the horse gate, you need to think about the Calvary <laughs> And you need to think about war, okay? When you think of the horse gate, those are the two things you need to think about. The cavalry, the cavalry's coming, all right? Uh, and you need to think about war. You need to think about battle. Um, Warren Wearsby, uh, he writes in his commentary this. He writes this. He says, The horse gate was adjacent to the temple area and became an important part of the nation's defense system. The horse gate, he says, reminds us that we too must always be ready to do battle. That's what he says. And that's the modern-day parallel. J. Vernon McGee. Anybody remember listening? Everybody listen to J. Vernon McGee? Anybody have their, his commentary stuff? It's really good, isn't it? Uh, I wish I could do his accent. Is he from Tennessee? He's a country guy. He used to come on the radio a lot, and uh, his accent is just, man, it's just classic. Um, but J. Vernon McGee, he said it this way. He said, Now the horse was an animal ridden by a warrior. Men only rode horses during a time of war. The horse was the symbol of war. The horse gate speaks of the soldier's service of the believer today. So the horse gate is this giant picture of spiritual warfare, spiritual warfare. The fact is that there is spiritual warfare going on all around us, one that we cannot necessarily see, and I would add one that many today don't even recognize. Uh, but there are three spiritual battles that, we, that, that are going on, okay? Three spiritual battles. One is, is what the Bible refers to as the battle of the flesh. It is that battle between the spirit and your sinful nature, the old man. Uh, the battle between the spirit and, and, again, what is known as your flesh. Peter writes in 1 Peter 2.11, Dear friend, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world to abstain from sinful desires which war against your souls. So the battle of the flesh. The second battle that we face is what the Bible would refer to as the battle of the world. Um, it's the pull of the world, the sway of the world, the sinful culture and its way of living. Uh, Paul writes in Romans 12 too, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. So as Christians, we're to, we're to fight against the current of our culture. We, we're called as Christians to swim upstream, uh, to live differently, to not allow the world to press us into its mold. And then thirdly, we have the battle of the devil. And this is, um, this is the spiritual warfare that, um, that I mentioned earlier, actually this morning we talked a little bit about. But Paul writes here in Ephesians 6, uh, 11 through 12, he says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over the present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. So you see how there's a spiritual battle that is taking place with your flesh within you, with the world around you, but also with the devil. 
And this is also why I would add that there are a number of times in the New Testament when the writers of the New Testament will use uh, militaristic terms that parallel the life of a Christian with that of a soldier. I'm going to just give you a few. Uh, Philemon um, uh, verse 2 says, To Archippus, our fellow soldier. Uh, 1 Timothy 6.12 says, Fight the good fight of faith. 2 Timothy 4, 6 through 7. The time has come for my departure, Paul says. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I've kept the faith. 2 Timothy 2, 3. Endure hardship with us like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. Of course, in Ephesians, Paul writes about how we are to, as believers, put on the full armor of God. What is this? This is all military talk, right? Why? It's because the writers of the New Testament knew that there is a spiritual war going on, and we are to be ready to fight. Uh, and I will say, I, I did not know or understand, I, I can be honest with you, I did not understand or know truly what spiritual warfare was until I became a pastor. I did not fully understood it. I knew it, I believed in it, I tried my best to be aware, but when I became a pastor, I became so much more aware of the spiritual warfare that is going around, and, um, and, and, it, and it keeps you on your toes. Quick question, how are we as believers called to fight in the battle? There's two ways. Prayer is one, okay? Um, but the other one is what? What is our only offensive weapon? The Word of God, okay? The Word of God. So we, we are, we're to, our only offensive weapons against our flesh, the Word, and the devil is the Word of God and prayer. So we are to do our fighting, not in word or talk, certainly not with fist. We're to do our fighting on our knees in prayer with the Bible open. Now, I want you to imagine with me for a moment. I want you to imagine what is happening to so many people, homes, marriages, etc., who never pray together and, and who do not know or obey the Scriptures. I want you to imagine what's happening right now. They do not pray together and they do, they do not know or study or obey the Scriptures. What do you think is happening? They're getting absolutely destroyed. Absolutely destroyed and crushed. We have got to learn what it means to open up our Bibles and to hit our knees in prayer. These are the only weapons in, in, in the spiritual battle that, that we have. Okay, gate number nine. Gate number nine. We have here in verse 29, it is the east gate. The east gate. Verse 29, it says, After them, Zadok, the son of Emmer, repaired opposite his own house. After him, Shemaiah, the son of uh, Sh Shekaniah, the keeper of the east gate, repaired. Now, the east gate led directly to the temple, and it is probably what we know today as the Golden Gate. Those of you who went to Israel, did you go by the Golden Gate? Did you see the Golden Gate? I got a picture for those. Those of us, we're going we're gonna to go there right now, okay? The Golden Gate. All right, this is what many people believe is, in fact, the east gate. Tradition actually says that Jesus entered in through this gate. Does anybody know when? Triumphant entry, the Palm, Palm Sunday when he made his triumphant entry into the city. Tradition says that he entered right through the East Gate, these, this gate. But really what I want you to, to know and, and think about regarding the East Gate is did you know that there's actually some prophetic passages related to this gate, the East Gate? Uh, Ezekiel chapter 43, if you want to jot it down. Ezekiel chapter 43, it says that the Lord, when he returns, will actually enter into the city through this gate. The east gate. Listen to this. Then the man brought me to the, to the gate facing east. And I saw the glory of the God uh, of Israel coming from the east. His voice was like the roar of rushing waters, and the land was radiant with his glory. The glory of the Lord entered the temple through the gate facing the east. Then the Spirit lifted me up and brought me into the inner court, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. And so as we think on this east gate here, I want you to think of the fact that this should, this should indeed remind us of the second coming of Christ. The east gate, or the golden gate now, should remind us of the second coming of Christ. Now, as you see this photo there of the east gate, um, you'll notice something about the gate. What do you notice? It's sealed up. It's walled up. It's, it's, it's blockaded. And it has been that way ever since 1541 A.D. 1541 A.D. Now, why is that? Well, if you remember your history, you may remember that it was during the time of the Ottoman Empire when the Muslim Turks, this would be, um, this would be Muslims who were Turkish. So the Muslim Turks actually took over Jerusalem and pretty much over the, the world at that time. Well, a Muslim sultan named Suleiman the Magnificent, 
That was his name, Suleiman the Magnificent. Does anybody know this, what I'm about to share? All right, Suleiman the Magnificent. Uh, he was the one who um, gave the ruling that these, these two entrances into the city from the east side, the east gate, was to be sealed up um, there on the wall. And I read where Suleiman the Magnificent, the reason why he had them boarded up is because he was aware of the prophecy given in Ezekiel there, which speaks of the Messiah entering into Jerusalem through this gate. And so I guess that his intention was to prevent that from happening, like he could prevent that from happening. Uh, but in, di in addition to this foolishness, uh, does anybody see something else here in this picture? What's out in front of the wall? Of the, of the wall? What does it look like? Tombstones. It's a cemetery. And Suleiman, the Magnificent, he also ordered that not only the gates be boarded up, he also ordered that there be a cemetery put in place there because he read where the Messiah was a priest and that priests were prohibited from coming into contact with the dead. So yeah, crazy, okay? But again, he, he had all this done because in his mind he was going to prevent Jesus from coming back. Now get this. As it relates to the second coming of Christ, there are approximately a thousand prophecies in the Bible concerning his second return, which is almost three times the number of prophecy, prophecies about Jesus' first coming. So the second coming of Christ, you need to know, is indeed a major, major doctrine or tenet of the faith. And, and no doubt, there are a mixed set of opinions probably in this very room here tonight about the timeline of when all that is going to happen, and, and I'm not going to get into that. But the fact of the matter is this, one day... It's going to happen, and the Bible says that we as believers need to be ready. Luke 12 says, Be dressed, ready for service, and keep your lamps burning, like men waiting for their master to return from a wedding banquet, so that when he comes and knocks, they can immediately open up the door for him. It will be good for those servants whose master finds him watching when he comes. I tell you the truth, he will dress himself to serve, will have them recline at the table, and will come and wait on them. You also must be ready. Because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect Him. And so at a time when you and I least expect it, Christ will return. And as a result, Jesus says, you better be ready. Now, how are we to, to remain ready as believers? Well, we're to be about the Father's business, and we are to pursue holiness and godly lives. 2 Peter 3, 10 through, 10 through 14 says, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, the heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire and the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its, its coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with this promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth, the home of righteousness. So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. So when we read of this east gate, we have every reason to associate this gate with the second coming of of Christ, and we are to remind ourselves, 1 John 2, verse 28, which says, Abide in him, that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. All right, one more gate. All right, we made it. The tenth gate here in chapter 3. The tenth gate, chapter 3, is called the muster gate. It is also referred to as the inspection gate. The muster gate or the inspection gate is found in verse 31. It says, And after him, Malchajah, one of the goldsmiths, repaired as far as the house of the temple servants and of the merchants opposite the muster gate and to the upper chamber of the corner. Now, the reason why this gate is called the muster gate or the inspection gate is because it was here at this gate where the troops would, would gather or muster together, uh, assemble together, so that the king himself could inspect them. In fact, the Hebrew word here has a military connotation and refers to just that, a mustering of the troops for numbering and inspection. In fact, how many of you have an NIV or NASB, NASB Bible here tonight? Anybody got a? Okay. If you have an NIV, NASB, the translation, it actually translates the word inspection gate, I believe. It doesn't use muster gate. Um, but inspection. But again, this is where the army would be numbered, reviewed, and registered. Now, the inspection gate, if you haven't already figured it out yet, uh, is to remind us of what? 
our inspection before the king, right? It is to remind us of the final judgment. And the Bible says that when the Lord returns, each one of us will appear before the king of heaven and we will be reviewed and we must give an account for our lives. Romans 14, 10 through 12 says, For we will all stand before God's judgment seat. It is written, As surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me, every tongue will acknowledge God. So then, each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. Now, let me be clear about this, all right? Because there's a lot of confusion about appearing before the Lord uh, in judgment. There are two judgments that are mentioned in the Bible, one for unbelievers and one for believers. The one for unbelievers is referred to in the Bible as the great white, uh, great white throne judgment. The great white throne judgment. It is found in Revelation 20, verse 11. It says this, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it. The earth and the heavens fled from his presence, and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. But the dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. And each person was judged according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. And anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. So there is this great white throne judgment. Again, it is for unbelievers. But then you have a judgment in the Bible mentioned that has really an identity all of its own, and it is called the, simply the judgment seat of Christ. It is also referred to as the Bema seat of Christ. Now, because the term Bema, many of you are like Bema, because we don't use that word Bema. So, so what does it mean? Well, the term Bema is actually used to speak of when athletes would be judged after a competition, and after the competition, they would go up before the judge at the Bema seat, and they would receive their rewards. And so this judgment, the judgment seat, or the Bema seat of Christ, is a judgment for, uh, of believers not to determine heaven or hell, but rather to determine the appropriate rewards that are to be assigned to the believer for their works of faith done here on this earth, Okay. So, so this judgment for believers is not a declaration of doom. Rather, it's an assessment of worthy, a worthiness. Okay, um, it is is not eternal. Eternal destiny is not the issue, but rather eternal reward is the issue. The judgment does not. This judgment does not determine entrance into the kingdom, but rather it determines the status of those already admitted. Does that make sense? It's very important we distinguish these these two judgments. So, as a believer, when you hear that we all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ. As a believer, there, should, there, there doesn't need to be this nervousness. And I've talked with believers before, and I mentioned that, and they're like, what do you mean? Huh. What do you mean? I didn't know we had to appear either. No, no, we, we all have to appear, but that shouldn't make us nervous. Why? Because our salvation is not determined by our good works here on this earth. Uh, this, 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 that's determined by our faith in Christ and His good work uh, on the cross. You see, for those of us who have trusted in Christ, we stand before the Lord on that day. He will not see us in our own righteousness. Praise God. Why? Because we don't have any. You got none. All right? I, I don't have any righteousness. To stand before the, the, the God of the universe and think that I got a shot of getting into heaven on the works that I've done. None of us, none of us have any righteousness to boast in that would grant us entrance into heaven. But rather, when God sees us, as believers, those who have repented and put our faith in Jesus Christ, God sees us as being clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ himself. And that is an amazing reality. So two things really quickly in closing. As it relates to the inspection gate uh, and our impending judgment before the Lord, number one, always remember this, that our deeds do not determine our salvation, but rather our deeds as believers simply demonstrate our salvation. So salvation is attained only through faith in Christ alone not by works. However, number two, your works do matter. Your works as a believer do matter. Your works matter because your works are the fruit of genuine salvation. Uh, they show that you have a heart that is now bent toward the Lord and that you love now what is good and what is holy. But also, your works are important because your works will be exposed to determine your reward and glory. All right, so your works matter. Well, Brad, wait a minute, I've heard this argument. Right, wait a minute, I, you know, works, you know, in, in, in here on earth and rewards in heaven, like won't then that mean that there's going to be this embarrassment in heaven and sorrow when we are evaluated and they realize that, 
Maybe we weren't as faithful as we should have been or could have been and, and been all that the Lord had called us, called us to be. Won't there be sorrow and embarrassment there in heaven? I think Sam Storms, I don't know how many of you know Sam Storms. He's a pastor out of Oklahoma. I think, I think he probably put it the best that I had, that I had read. And I'm just going to quote what he said about this, and, and then we'll be done. But he says this about being a Christian in heaven, coming to grips with this evaluation and distribution of rewards. He said this. He said, don't be afraid that with the exposure and evaluation of your deeds, regret and remorse will, will spoil the bliss of heaven. He said, if there be tears or grief for opportunities squandered or tears of shame for sins committed, he will simply wipe them away. The inevitable joy of forgiving grace will swallow up all sorrow and the beauty of Christ will blind you to anything other than the splendor of who he is and what he has by grace accomplished on your behalf. Well said. I like that. And so as we wrap up this whole chapter thinking on the inspection gate, listen, church, may we live our lives such that the Lord might be pleased with us on that day we stand before him in faith. Amen? Amen. Let's stand. I'll pray. And then we'll be, we'll be done. <clears throat> Have I been preaching the whole time with it right here? Nobody's thought? All right, let's pray. Father, we do thank you for this evening and on just a good day of worship. And, um, and so, Lord, we're, we're thankful to uh, be gathered together as a church and to, to be a part of, of what you're doing, um, not just in our midst, but, Lord, what you're doing in us, Lord. We, we, you're sanctifying us, and, um, Lord, you're setting us apart uh, for your purposes and for your glory. And um, we, just, we just ask, God, that you would continue to do that. Uh, Lord, help us to be faithful. God, every day we wake up, Lord, before our feet hit the floor, God, we, we want to um, give you our lives and, and all that is within it. And, um, Lord, our time and our attention and our focus, even as we go through doing the, the things that you have before us, Lord, we want to be mindful of how you want to use us and how you want others around us to see Jesus living in us. And so, Lord, help us to be mindful of that this week as we leave. Uh, Lord, again, we thank you for your word and a chance to study it here tonight. And, uh, Lord, I'm really excited about this coming month and uh, our missions emphasis time. And, and Lord, uh, you, you desire for us, I know, just to think more outwardly and to think about those who are lost, not just around the world, but right here in this city. And so, Lord, help us to be obedient, whatever that, whatever that looks like, whatever you call us to. Help us to be found faithful and, and, and loving you and serving you. So, Lord, thank you for these that are here tonight. Bless us now as we go. In Jesus' name, amen.